to do. In this video, we'll talk about unit two, thermal physics. So it's all about heat. Again, this is for Cambridge IGCSE. It does kind of work for Excel though. But this is with the updated version of the syllabus post 2023. Now, where we start, as usual, let's talk about the change in syllabus starting from 2023 when it comes to heat. Now, thermal physics has experienced the most changes. First, they claim to have removed the gas laws. I'll talk about why I say claim in a bit. And they've removed the measurement of temperature, meaning any question involving a thermometer and asking you about the properties of a thermometer or what we call a thermocouple sometimes, these have been removed. So as you're solving past papers or revising older papers, you'll find questions that ask you about the sensitivity, the linearity, the range, what substances should I use? How do I calibrate the thermometer? What are the advantages of a thermocouple? These have been completely removed. They've also removed the mention of thermal capacity or heat capacity, not specific heat capacity, just heat capacity. If there was a slight difference between them, they've removed it because it's kind of redundant in a sense. If you already know specific heat capacity, you can calculate heat capacity. They have added the absolute scale of temperature. In other words, they've added the unit called Kelvin. We'll discuss the difference between Kelvin and Celsius today. But I want to focus on this thing over here. The reason I'm saying they claim to have removed the term gas laws and why it's not really honest of them is because they removed the names of the laws, obviously. But let me show you something in the syllabus itself. This is the note about gas laws in the syllabus. This is the new syllabus. It asks you to describe the effect on pressure of a gas of changing temperature and changing volume. And then you calculate pressure and volume using PV equals constant or P1 V1 equals P2 V2. If you've studied anything before this, you will realize that this still exists. See, it's in the syllabus. They've claimed to have removed gas laws, but this is still there. So describing how the pressure and change in pressure of a gas in terms of the motion of the particles and collisions, that's still there, so still gases. Describe the pressure and changes in pressure of a gas in terms of forces exerted by the particles colliding with the surface, creating pressure, again, that's still there. Random motion of microscopic particles, which we also call Brownian motion, is still there. Knowing that microscopic particles may be moved by collisions with light, fast-moving molecules, and correctly use the terms atoms or molecules, this is still related to Brownian motion and still there. So even though the syllabus claims to have removed gas laws, whether you're a core student or whether you're an extended student, so extended on the right and core on the left, they, they, it really hasn't been removed, not directly, not, not the way you think it has been. So most of the old questions in the past papers that involve the behavior of gases will still work, solve them just as they are, keep going. Right? Just a reminder, note to course, course students, if you ever see a slide or a rule or an equation with the term extended on it, this is not for you. It's not in your final exam, but listen to the chapter anyway. Listen to the topic anyway. It will help develop your overall understanding of physics, and it will help you understand some of the concepts that you do study in core, but we don't elaborate on. You get the idea. So what are we studying today? It's a very short unit. We'll talk about the kinetic theory of matter, meaning the difference between solids, liquids, and gases. A lot of people complain it sounds a lot like chemistry. Kind of does. And what's the change in state? Melting and boiling and evaporation and the details behind the change in state. We'll also talk about thermal expansion. Change in what? Volume of a gas or a solid or a liquid when heated. Now, while we're talking about these, we're also going to be talking about the Kelvin scale. So how do we measure temperature in Kelvin from Celsius once we define what temperature is? We'll talk about Brownian motion and the behavior of gases again. These have not changed, so I'm keeping them as is. Conduction, convection, radiation, because these, these are the methods of heat transfer that we're familiar with. And we'll finalize by talking about how we calculate heat energy. 
whether it's the change in temperature of an object using mc delta t, or change in state of an object, which is ml. Obviously, any course students listening to this right now, don't worry, this is extended, and you'll see that note as we move along the slides. Let's get started. Solids, liquids, and gases. The basics. All matter consists of solids and liquids and gases. One of three, one of three states of matter. Quite simple. But in unit two, when it comes to thermal physics, please keep in mind, when we describe something, any kind of matter, we often describe it twice. From the outside, what's going to what's going on to it, what's happening to its shape, to its volume, to its mass, to its pressure. So we talk about the outer shape of the object, and then we have to describe why that outer shape or volume or mass or pressure has been affected in terms of molecules. So all matter, just to simplify, will be assumed to be made up of molecules. And all of these molecules are either moving, they're vibrating in place, they have, or obviously sliding, moving freely, they also have a certain space between them, and they have attractive forces between them, which we will call intermolecular forces, or simply bonds. James Bond. Da -na -da -na. I know it's an old joke, I'm never going to let it go, I'm never going to give you up. Huh, I rickrolled you. I'm sorry, let's move on. It's way too early for me to do this. Yeah, come on. So what was I saying? Yes. So we're going to talk about any kind of matter in the rest of this unit twice, on the outside and on the inside. So on the outside, solids have a fixed shape and a fixed volume. Inside, the molecules are closely packed. They're very close to each other, very small spaces, and they vibrate about a fixed position. They don't move around freely. And their bonds are very, very, very strong. Liquids, on the other hand, have no fixed shape, but they do have a fixed volume. In other words, they take the volume, sorry, they take the shape of the container they're in. Solids have a nice fixed shape and that doesn't change. However, in terms of molecules, they're loosely packed, which means they have small spacing between the molecules and they slide over each other. Finally, the bonds between them are still strong. They're not very strong like a solid, but they're strong. This is why they also have a fixed volume. It's thanks to the strength of these bonds that they have a fixed volume. This has a fixed volume and a fixed shape because the bonds are extremely strong. Gases, on the other hand, have no fixed shape and no fixed volume. Why? Because in terms of molecules, first of all, they have very large spaces. And they move very freely and fast at high speeds and randomly because they have very weak or what we call virtually no bonds. So it's the difference between them. Next. We need to know how to define temperature. Whenever you heat a substance, on the outside, it gets hotter. The temperature rises. But on the inside, the molecules gain energy and start to move, maybe it vibrate if this is a solid, for example. They vibrate faster. And the faster and faster and faster they vibrate, the higher the temperature of the substance. So when you heat something, the molecules inside move faster. This is why we define temperature as the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a substance. It's often measured in degrees Celsius. Basically, how fast are the molecules moving? Heat it up, molecules move faster. Cool it down, molecules move slower. But now that we've mentioned that molecules have kinetic energy, molecules inside a substance also have potential energy. Like they have both kinetic because they're moving and they have potential because they're trying to attract each other. The further away the molecules are from each other, the more potential energy they have. And the closer the molecules are to each other, the less potential energy they, they have. So potential energy of the molecules depends on their spacing, at least until we hit a gas. But I'm not going to get into details about gases right now. 
This is what we call internal energy. So when you heat something, the internal energy of that gas or so solid or liquid increases because the molecules inside move faster and they also move farther apart. We are going to segue this into uh, thermal expansion later. Yeah. Let's talk about temperature scales. But before that, actually, there's a question, and it's actually relevant to the previous part. What do you mean by no fixed volume? A gas has no fixed shape and no fixed volume, meaning a gas fills up whatever container it's in. So if I ask you, what's the size of this gas? It's the size of the container. If I tell you the container is 10 meters squared, uh, cubed, I mean, then the gas inside is also 10 meter cubed. It takes the shape and the volume of the container. Yeah. Let's talk about the Kelvin scale. Let's talk about the Kelvin scale. Now, let me identify a problem with the Celsius scale before we talk about the Kelvin scale. The problem with the Celsius scale is that it has negative values. The smallest value on the Celsius scale is not zero. Zero is the melting point of ice, whereas 100 is the boiling point of water, which means there is stuff that's colder than ice, which makes sense. You have temperatures like negative 10, negative 20, negative 50, and so on. So it gets colder and colder and colder. But here's the thing. What was the definition of temperature, if you remember? was defined as the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a substance. Why? Because it depends on how fast the molecules are moving. Average speed, average kinetic energy is because we're getting the average speed. We're not looking at the fastest. We're not looking at the slowest. We're looking at something in between. So the higher the temperature of a substance, the faster the molecules should move. And the lower the temperature of a substance, the slower the molecules should move. And technically speaking, at zero degrees of whatever, this unit is, this should mean that the molecules have zero kinetic energy, which is false when it comes to the Celsius scale because there's stuff that's colder than zero. Now, Kelvin, Lord Kelvin, did not like that idea a very long time ago. So he decided to find out the coldest temperature in the universe so he can change the scale a bit. Through his mathematics and experimentation, he discovered that the coldest temperature you can ever reach is negative 273.15, but we just ignore the decimals, degrees Celsius. That's the coldest temperature in the universe. This is the temperature at which the molecules have no kinetic energy or the least amount of kinetic energy. The molecules of a substance are not moving. Molecules of substance are not a moving. So he put down a scale next to the original Celsius scale, and he put his zero where the coldest Celsius degree is. So this is in degrees Celsius at negative 273. This is Kelvin's zero. And he used the exact same scale. So he jumped up the same number of degrees so that the zero is 273 degrees. The 100 Celsius, is 373 degrees. So you're moving the same number of degrees. So it's almost the same scale. It's just that we shifted where the zero is. And we call this absolute zero. We call this absolute zero. It's very easy to convert Kelvin to Celsius or back. Kelvin is Celsius plus 273. So if I say 100 Celsius, that's 373 Kelvin because you add 273 to it. Obviously, you do the reverse. If you're changing Celsius to a, sorry, Kelvin to Celsius, you subtract 273. Very good. Now, let's talk about how do we change states. When you heat any kind of substance, a solid or a liquid or a gas, when you heat it, the temperature rises because the molecules are now moving faster and faster and faster. But once it reaches a certain temperature, let's say you start off as a solid with some ice at negative 20 degrees or something. Once it reaches the melting point, which is zero degrees Celsius, that's the temperature where ice starts to melt, it changes from solid to liquid. And during melting, 
the temperature stays constant. It doesn't change. It does not change. Which should make no sense. But then, once it's completed its process of melting and now the substance is a liquid, it gets hotter. It's no problem if you heat it up. This water is now hot. It's in liquid state. But once it reaches the boiling point, which is 100 degrees Celsius, you'll find that the temperature stays constant again during the boiling process. During the boiling process, the temperature stays constant until it's completely turned into a gas and then the gas heats up. But the question is, and this is the most important question here, why is the temperature constant during melting and boiling? Because naturally when you heat a substance, the molecules inside want to move faster, so they do. But they also move farther apart, up to the limit of the bonds between them. Like, so molecules are strongly bonded. But if you heat it up enough, what's going to happen? It can't move any further or any faster. So the kinetic energy of the substance does not increase during melting. Instead, the energy is used to weaken the bonds between the molecules in order to push them farther apart, makes them weaker. This is why the bonds in a solid are very strong, whereas in liquids, we just say they're strong. What about boiling? Well, if you leave the substance boil, some water to boil, it gets converted completely into a gas because all of the energy is used to what, or a lot of the energy is used to what, break the bonds between the molecules so that they can successfully escape. Okay? So during melting, the temperature stays constant because the energy is used to weaken the bonds. During boiling, the temperature stays constant because the energy absorbed is used to break the bonds and the kinetic energy does not increase. In either of these cases, it does not increase. So temperature is constant during melting and boiling. It's also constant during condensation and freezing. So if I draw this graph in reverse, during freezing and condensation, the temperature also stays constant because the energy is used for something else, for the potential energy. So to answer the question that's on the chat box here, or in the chat box here, how do molecules have potential energy? Because the molecules have space between them. If any two molecules are trying to attract each other, but they're kept farther away from each other for reasons, whatever the reasons are, they have potential energy. And the farther and farther and farther the molecules are from each other, the more potential energy these molecules have. Okay. Very good. Next up. One more change in state is called evaporation. What is evaporation? It's when the most energetic molecules on the surface of a liquid break their bonds and escape. So when a liquid evaporates, it doesn't just evaporate because, hey, it just, just wants to. It's because, if you remember, we defined temperature as the average kinetic energy. That's because some molecules have very, like if we take a look here, some molecules have very high temperatures and energies, and some molecules have less energy. Temperature is a measure of their average. But if you have the most energetic molecules, if you have the most energetic molecules already on the surface of the liquid, meaning they have most of the energy of the substance, what do they do that energy? They break their bonds and they escape. So now the liquid has changed into a gas. A liquid has changed the gas. You've broken your bonds and they escape without heating. Like we have not heated the substance at all. This is just naturally on its own. But do you know what the problem with evaporation is? is that the more a substance evaporates and more and more energetic molecules leave, whatever is left behind has now less energy. So it has less energy than usual, less kinetic energy than usual. The temperature of the liquid decreases. This is why if you go take a shower and you get out of the shower, just wash your face or dump some water in your hair and just leave it there, you start to feel cold. Why? Because as the liquid on your body evaporates, and turns into a gas, 
it gets colder. The liquid itself gets colder. So if the liquid gets colder, what will it do? It will absorb heat from whatever is stuck to it. So this is why we sweat, by the way. Like the reason we sweat is because sweat, after it gets released, is on all over your skin, all over your body. And it's trying to escape. It's evaporating. But as the sweat evaporates, the temperature of the remaining sweat decreases. So it absorbs heat from your body to continue evaporating. And you cool down. So the temperature decreases. There are three things that we can do to increase the rate of evaporation. You can heat it, obviously, that's more energy. You can increase the surface area. So just dump this water onto the floor. And since evaporation only happens to the most energetic molecules, on the surface, the more surface area I have, the better. So increasing the surface area. And finally, air currents. Like if I've got some wind, like if I have a fan running or I've just got some wind, a breeze passing by, what does that breeze do? It gives energy to the molecules on the surface. So these molecules can now escape faster, that is. Now, before I move on to thermal expansion, any questions of the previous section? Solids and liquids and gases? No? Okay, very good. Let's talk about thermal expansion. What is it? We've already mentioned it before, by the way. But when you heat something, when you heat a substance, a solid or a liquid or a gas, the volume increases. Why? Because as we said, when you heat something, the molecules move faster, but then they also move farther apart. So as the space between the molecules increases, the pressure increases. Okay. I'm sorry, not the pressure. What, what was I saying? Not the pressure. The volume increases. My bad. Volume. Hmm, I need to ventilate this room. I'm lacking oxygen. So do all substances expand the same? I would say no. Gases expand more than liquids. And liquids expand more than solids. Gases expand more than liquids. And liquids expand more than solids. Why? Because gases are already far apart and they have very weak bonds. Liquids are closer to each other with stronger bonds. And solids are already super close with a very strong bond. So it's hard to make these molecules move farther apart. It's much easier to make a gas molecule move farther away from other gas molecules. Obviously, thermal expansion depends on the temperature. Heat it more, it expands more, clearly. And thermal expansion also depends on the initial size of the object. Meaning if you have an, had an object that's very small and you have another object that's a lot longer and you heat them both to the same temperature, they will both expand. But the longer object will expand more than the shorter object, simply because it's got more matter and molecules to move farther away from each other. Good. Cases where thermal expansion is a problem. So where is it problematic? Well, let's mention a couple of examples. So you probably remember the railway tracks, right? Railway tracks. If you have a railway track, toot, 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 like this, and you just let it expand over time, it will expand, but it won't expand the way you want because it's held in place with nails and screws and everything else. It ends up buckling, meaning it just bends all over itself like this, and any train that tries to go over this will derail for sure. So how do we fix this? Because it wants to get longer, so it can, so it gets longer from the sides. We always build our railway tracks within sections. Why? Because leaving sections allows each small section to expand a little bit when it gets hot during the summer. 
and during the winter it contracts and it goes back to its original size. It's not a problem. Or even if it's slightly smaller, it will not matter at all. Okay. Now, another problem with thermal expansion, and honestly, it's more about thermal contraction than expansion, would be electrical cables, pylons. The reason why we hang electrical cables from these towers or pylons, and we hang them loose like this, we don't just stretch the pylons and stretch the wires in the air, can them? Why? Because if you stretch it like this, and it's not thermal expansion this time, that's the problem, it's contraction. If it cools down, this cable will want to contract. It wants to get shorter. And as it gets shorter, it pulls on the towers. It pulls on the towers and it could break. But if you already give it some extra slack, and then come winter when the temperature decreases and it wants to contract, it's still got space to contract. Uh, why is it longer? I'm sorry, why does it... Uh, here's a question, guys. Why does it expand more when an object is longer? Because where does the expansion come from? The space between the molecules. If you only have two molecules and they move farther apart this way, this much, here's your expansion. But if you had four molecules and they all expand with the same extra distance, this much, What's the total expansion? A lot more. Even if you heat at the same temperature, which will increase the space is the same, because you have more molecules, they'll expand more. Now, let's move on to the behavior of gases for a bit. Let's talk about Brownian motion. Is it, I'm sorry, let's go back for a second. Of course, it's related to liquid expansion. I mean, when heated, what will happen to the volume of a liquid? It will increase, it will expand, right? Because the space between the liquid molecules increases. That's all you need to know. So what's Brownian motion? Or like Brownian motion, as some people like to say, but Brownian is the correct term. So what's Brownian motion? Brownian motion is defined as the random and jerky or irregular motion of dust particles in air. So if you look through a microscope into a smoke cell, which got which is a lot of dust and air molecules, obviously, you will find that these small dust cells are moving random and jerky, like these small dust particles. We often call them specks of light because the way microscopes work is that they shine a very strong light into whatever is inside. In this case, it's smoke, so it got a lot of particles. And that light reflects up into the microscope's lenses, and you see bright dots. Why are they moving random and jerky? Because the air molecules that are around them, as they're moving, they're also moving fast and randomly. But what do they do? They eventually collide with this dust particle because there are millions of air molecules. But as these air molecules collide with the dust, this dust will move. Think of it this way. You're slapping around the dust. The dust will move. And then when it collides with new air molecules, it moves again. Collides with new air molecules, it moves again. Collides with more air molecules, it moves again. That's why we call it jerky or irregular motion. It doesn't smoothly move around. No, no, no. It just gets suddenly knocked away. Because the air molecules collide with it from all directions. This... This, this movement is called Brownian motion. Random jerky motion of dust particles in here. Yeah, that slide came in a bit late. I don't know why. Yeah, let's talk about the behavior of gases. Like how do gases behave? In order to understand how gases behave, we need to define how a gas applies pressure. Now, you take a look at a single molecule 
as this gas is moving, it's colliding with the walls. Every time a gas molecule collides with the walls, it experiences a change in momentum. It experiences a change in momentum because anything that collides with a wall for something and rebounds experiences a change in momentum here because the direction has changed. Maybe the speed has changed as well. Now you may be saying, okay, so what? Let it change. Well, that collision and change in momentum applies a force. And if you apply that force over a large area of whatever this container is, this will give you pressure. Now, any mention of momentum, just, just a second, like see this here, this small part is extended. So I'm not going to be mentioning change in momentum or anything else when it comes to core physics. Yeah. Let's see how gases behave. When heated or when cooled and so on. So how does temperature affect the volume of a gas? We already mentioned that. If you heat something, like a gas, if you heat something, the molecules move faster and farther apart. So thermal expansion occurs. So when you increase the temperature, the volume increases. When you increase the temperature, the volume increases. Why? Because the molecules move faster and farther apart. So we say that temperature and volume are directly proportional, which, which makes sense. What about pressure? If you heat a gas and the volume is constant, if you heat a gas and the volume is constant, the molecules, as they're moving faster, they collide harder with the walls of the container, applying more pressure. So when the temperature increases, the pressure also increases. So they're directly proportional. Easy peasy. Finally, how does volume affect pressure? Because here's the thing, but do we have to heat? No, we don't. So when you have a gas inside the piston cylinder arrangement, this is called a piston. This is called a cylinder. And you compress it. You forcefully decrease the space between the molecules. And when the space between the molecules decreases, the pressure increases because the molecules are now colliding with the walls and each other more frequently. Whereas here, because they have a lot, had a lot of free space, they didn't collide with each other as frequently as they do now. So when the volume decreases, the pressure increases because the molecules are colliding with each other more frequently. They're not moving faster. They're not harder. They're just more frequent. So we say that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. But wait, there's more. You'll notice that in every single one of these cases, something was constant. If you're heating and the volume rises, the pressure does not change. If you're heating, but the volume is constant, like you've trapped it in a container, pressure will increase. Maybe even go boom. And finally, that, by the way, that's what happened with gas tanks in movies. When they fire a piston and it explodes, the reason it explodes is because the temperature of the gas inside increases so much that the pressure of the gas cannot be held in place with that can, that cylinder. So the cylinder itself blows up because it can't handle the pressure. And finally, when it comes to how volume affects pressure, the temperature was constant, so that's not too hard to achieve. But there's an equation. And as you saw earlier, it's PV equals constant, meaning pressure times volume is always constant. So the equation we use is P1, V1 equals P2, V2, which is the pressure times volume before you compress or do whatever, equals the pressure times volume after. It's an equation. It's a lot. So let's see how do we use this. Let's assume, let's just assume that uh, you have a balloon. 
Which one? Silence. Oh, there it is. You have a balloon. Let's say the volume of this balloon is 100 centimeter cubed. It's not a very large balloon. And it has a pressure right now of 1 times 10 to the power of 5 Pascal. Normal atmospheric pressure. But somebody decides to sit on the balloon. So they're going to squish it. Obviously, bad idea, but they're going to squish it. If I tell you that the volume now after the squish is, uh, you've lost how much? Let's say, let's say it's 80 centimeter cube. The volume decreases to 80. Can you find the new pressure? Of course you can. So here's the rule. P1, P1 equals P2, P2. What's P1? 1 times 10 power 5. What's V1? 100. Now, you might be thinking, wh why am I using centimeters in a question which often involves just meters and pascals and stuff? Just leave it as is. You'll now you'll learn it a bit. Okay? So pressure 1, volume 1. No, this is extended, as I said in the previous page, right? Equals pressure two, volume two. So pressure one is one times 10 power five. Volume was 100, no problem. Equals, what's pressure two? You don't know, I want it. Times, what's the second volume of the balloon after the squish? It's 80. So P2 is equal to one times 10 power five. Times 100. Oops. 10 power 5 times 100 over 8. This will give me, and I prefer to write my answers in standard form as it's very long. 1.25 times 10 to the power of 5 Pascal. Done. Next, let's move along. Let's talk about conduction, convection, and radiation. These are the three methods of heat energy transfer that we have, depending on whether that substance that's transferring the heat is a solid or a liquid or a gas. If it's a solid or a liquid or a gas. If it's a solid and you heat up one end of it, here's the sequence that happens. These molecules gain energy. They move faster. They collide with their neighboring energy. So as they collide, they give them some energy and they move faster. And that continues to happen. The atoms start to vibrate faster, colliding with nearby atoms, so it takes a long, long time. This is how conduction occurs in non-metals, by the way. What about metals? Now, unlike non-metals, metals also have what we call free-moving, Electrons. Removing electrons. So you've got double the conduction capacity or more. Because the atoms, sure, they gain energy and they vibrate and collide with nearby atoms. But then you've got a lot of free moving electrons. As soon as they gain heat, what do they do? They travel very quickly through the solid, reaching the farther ends and colliding with the atoms at the farther end. Not just nearby atoms. No, they collide with everything along the way. That's why metals are such good conductors of heat. Why are they good conductors of heat? Because they have free moving electrons. So examples of good conductors, basically all metals, iron, copper, steel, keep them in mind if you're ever asked to suggest a metal. What's a bad conductor? Anything that you know, plastic, rubber, wood, glass, wool, Air. Very good. So that's the difference in conduction between a non-metal and a metal. What's convection? Very important because it's often required to be described properly. So what is it? So it's when heat can travel through a liquid. Heat cannot travel through a liquid by conduction. You might be in. Wondering why? Well, that's because molecules and liquids slide over each other. They don't collide with each other very frequently. So instead, what you do is, well, 
if you heat this corner, what's going to happen to the liquid here? You'll say it gets hot. Okay. So when it gets hot, what happens to its volume? It increases, it expands. And when the volume increases, this is the important bit. The density of the liquid decreases. It becomes less dense. And if a liquid is less dense, it will rise and it will float. So, okay, cool. You've got hot water that goes up. What about the cold water that was already here? It goes down. So you've got hot water rising and cold water sinking. All right? Why? Because hot gases are less dense. Cold is more dense. This cycle is called the convection. Correct. This cycle is called the convention. Convection, Asdi. Current. There we go. So remember, it doesn't only happen in liquids, it also happens in gases. So if I have a room and I have a, an air conditioner in the room, in this corner of the room, if I cool down the air, cold air sinks because it's more dense, hot air rises because it's less dense. Radiation, the last of the the three methods of heat transfer. Radiation is basically an infrared wave emitted from the surface of any object, as long as it's hot. If an object has temperature, which means everything, it emits an invisible type of wave called an infrared wave, which transfers heat. Now, infrared waves are electromagnetic. They're released from the surface of the object. But what does it depend on? Like, what's it affected by? Obviously, obviously, temperature affects it. If you heat something more, it will emit more radiation. All right. And what else does it depend on? And that's very, oh, well, second, it depends on size. If you have two objects, one that's small, one that's large, and they both have the base. Basically, this is their surface area. The large one would be always best for radiation. Why? Because it's got a larger surface area, so there's more of the hot surface that gives out heat. All right. The third thing that affects... <laughs> the third thing that affects... I'm sorry, somebody sent me a funny, a funny joke. Uh, third thing that affects how much heat is absorbed or emitted by a surface is the color. This is the most important bit. We say that black is the best emitter and absorber of radiation or infrared waves, whereas white is the worst emitter and absorber of infrared radiation. Now, what do I mean? If I get you these four cans, as you can see, one of them is dull black, one of them is shiny white, one of them is shiny black, and the other is dull white, and you put a heater between them, all three of these will get the exact same heat at the same time. you will realize that the black will give you the highest temperature increase. Whereas the shiny white or the silver will give you the lowest temperature increase. All right. So black is the best absorber. It's very easy to absorb. Shiny white, because it's a good reflector, is not a very good absorber. They're also the best emitter and worst emitter, black and white respectively. If you get a container and you pour it full of hot water, this means that all of the surfaces are at the same temperature, so they should be emitting heat at the same rate. But no, if you paint each face of that box a different color, one's dull black, the other is shiny black, third is a is dull white, and the fourth is what? Shiny white. The shiny white side will emit, because now the object is hot, the least amount of radiation, whereas the dull black side will emit the most amount of radiation. So remember, 
black is the best in both of the cases. So I love wearing black, but in both cases, best emitter and best absorber. Silver is the worst emitter and absorber. Shiny white is silver, essentially. Yeah. The last thing we want to discuss for today, and we'll end the session after we're done here, would be specific heat capacity. What do I mean by that? If I give you a bottle of water and ask you to go ahead and heat it, you'll just pour it into a kettle, for example, and turn on the switch or put it on a stove top, like if it's not a digital kettle or anything. So as the water heats up, it needs energy to keep heating. The question is, how much energy, how much energy do we need? Well, that depends on a few things. First, it depends on the mass of the substance. Like what, how much are you carrying to get the specific interest? Second, you need to know the change in temperature. All right. And finally, what is C? C, this is mass. Just let me type that down. Delta T is change in temperature. And C is defined as specific heat capacity, which is the amount of heat energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram by one degree Celsius. This means that if I have one kilogram of, let's say water, because it's a very common substance, water, and I tell you that in order to heat it from 20 degrees to 21 degrees, I need to give it 4,000 joules, for example. This is called specific heat capacity. It tells you how much energy does that one kilogram of water need to be raised by one degree Celsius. That's all you need. That's all it is. How much energy does one kilogram need to be raised by one degree? If I want to raise it by 10 degree, you multiply it by the change in temperature. If you want to, like, to find out what if you had less than one kilogram, you multiply it by the mass. It could be half a kilogram, could be a quarter, whatever it is. Now, let's see how we can use this formula. An object has a mass of 2.5 kilograms and a specific heat capacity of 1,760 joules per kilogram Celsius. So he's giving me the mass and he's giving me the specific heat capacity. Calculate the heat energy needed to raise the temperature of an object from 25 to 50. 25 to A, 50. 25. So calculate the heat energy. E equals MC delta T. What's M? 2.5. What's C? 1,760. And what's delta T? 50 minus 25, because I want the change in temperature. The 2.5 times 1,760 times 50 minus 25. This gives me a nice answer of 1.10 oh, times 10 to the power of 5 joules. Do you have any questions regarding specific capacity or anything before that? Oh, I see a question. Uh, is the radiation only infrared waves that are emitted or absorbed? Yes. The black and white that we're talking about would be just radiation. And can you repeat how to calculate the pressure of a gas? Of course, I can go back and show you how again. But let's stay here. This, what does the C stand for? The C stands for specific heat capacity. All right. Excellent. You're welcome. Oh, by the way, just to, just to answer your question, what if I want to find C? What if I want to find C? Make it the subject. Like, what if this was a different question and you want to find C? It's going to be E over M delta T. So you substitute the energy, the mass, and change in temperature, and you find the specific heat capacity. He has to give you these, by the way. When you're using both of these equations, mc delta t or ml, you won't be given the value of energy. Like if I ask you, hey, please calculate the value of c, which is e over the m delta t, or please calculate the value of l, which is e over m. Sometimes the e won't be given directly. Instead, what he will do 
instead what he will do is he will give me power. Yes, this is also extended. It's a continuation of the previous one. He will give me power. If you remember back from unit one, power equals work done or energy over time. So if I wanted energy, we say it's power times time. So sometimes you're going to have to substitute power times time over here in order to get LC, uh, specific heat capacity or latent heat. That's all. So keep this in mind as well when you're solving latent heat and heat capacity questions. It's a very common idea. Thank you very much for watching. Do you have any other questions regarding specific heat capacity or latent heat before we end the session here? See no questions. So I'll see you guys in the next session. Have a nice day.